We are delighted to have with us today two members of the ensemble Profeti della Quinta. Ilam Rotem is the music director and baritone and also harpsichordist, and Doron Schleifer is a countertenor. The ensemble focuses on the vocal repertoire of the 16th and early 17th centuries. They say that they aim to create vivid and expressive performances for audiences today, while at the same time considering period performance practices. The ensemble comprises five male singers, augmented as needed by harpsichord and chitarone. We are very happy to have with us today two leading members of Profeti della Quinta, Ilam Rotem, who is a singer, a bass, he plays harpsichord and he's director of the ensemble, and Doron Schleifer, the countertenor. Welcome and thanks for being with us today. Hi. <laughs> so let's start. Tell us about Profeti. Uh, how did you get together? What was the genesis of the group? And Maybe even first explain the name. So uh, the ensemble is something uh, I initiated in in the time during my high school time. Uh, I kind of found out slowly that the music that I like most is music from older times. So I kind of gathered some friends and we tried to sing some old music. And where did you where did you grow up, Elan? Uh, in the north of Israel. And uh, I was in a kind of an art high school in Kibbutz Kaboy. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and the name Profeti de la Quinta is, is kind of a joke. In Hebrew, it's Nevi'ei HaQuinta, and it sounds like a rock band or something. <laughs> and uh, everyone agreed that we have to change it. But it was just too late to change and just uh, stick with it now. And then when we moved to Europe, uh, we just translated it to Italian, and it sounds great in Italian, and everybody likes it. And the quinta uh, is is what the is that the interval? Yeah, the, the idea is, is the interval. Yeah, that was you know, that kind of central interval in older music or music in general. Mm -hmm. And we we tried to, to translate it to English first, but it was very. <laughs> problematic to say the prophets of the fifth and nobody understand what the fifth is so we tried yeah. to do the perfect fifth and then it became a tongue twister so the prophets of the perfect fifth was too much yeah so we decided on italian yeah well it makes it more exotic to have it in a foreign language for us yeah. <laughs> and daron you grew up in jerusalem yes and did i read that there, you, I you were Indiana. singing in the, in the synagogue there yeah that was uh, my first singing experience as a child, I was singing in my father's synagogue as a soloist, a boy soloist. He would give me parts, little parts here and there. He served as, as a cantor, uh, for those who don't know my father here. Um, and uh, yeah, and from that I, uh, uh, I had this experience, but I actually was a pianist at that time. You made the transition from boy soprano to countertenor. Yeah, but not, did, not directly. Through, through baritone? I, yeah, it was through baritone and tenor and experiments. And uh, when, when my voice started changing, I couldn't sing anything. And then it returned slowly in like one small octave between C and C. And I was trying to sing baritone in a, a, an ensemble. And then it didn't really work. So I tried tenor. And then I decided to not sing for a while and i went to the army and when i uh, uh, got released from the army then uh, i started singing professionally and i rediscovered the that part that was a remnant from uh, from the childhood so what's the technique how do you how do you access that part of your register uh, it's not like something you can describe so much. It's basically what people do when they sing very high. They do a chest voice thing or a falset thing. The, some people say it's the same. Some people say, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but uh, the most important is that for me specifically, this is what worked best for my voice. 
And this is why I chose to do it because um, it's not like that for everybody. Some people project more on their tenor range and some on their baritone range. And for me, it just was the, the easiest and the, the most natural for me. So in the ensemble, uh, the year, there are two countertenors, I think, in the ensemble. And now it is, yeah. So you're able to sing the soprano and the alto parts. I know in some of Rossi's music, at least the way it's written, it goes up to high A. Um, do you guys access that or do you transpose it down? Yeah, the, the high A stuff should be trans, uh, transposed down. You can see it from the combination of... of of clefs. If there mm -hmm. is a specific combination of clefs, then you know that it should be transposed down. Mm -hmm. And so. they call the, the the voice that was called alto in that time was in fact sung by what we call today high tenors. Because the word alto or altos means high. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean originally it had a good reason, but at that time it, it just became a certain range. And these parts were sung by what we call today high tenors. And, and the fact it. that all of these terms, uh, cantus, soprano, alto, altus, those are all in the masculine gender form of the noun. So we forget that these all were originally sung, at least in, in the ensembles, by, by male singers, uh, in sacred music anyway. Yeah, probably, yeah, yeah probably. But uh, yeah, the singers were like professional music making was mostly by male sing uh, male musicians. Uh, although at the time of Rossi, things started to change. And in fact, we know that the sister of Rossi was a singer. And we also know of some female singers from that time that even sang in church sometimes. So things started to kind of break up mm. uh, in that time. But the default, especially for you know religious things was was just male singer so what attracted you to the music of salamone rossi uh, doron you want to say when when you first heard of rossi if i will start then it will be a problematic thing because i was the one who was actually resenting it <laughs> uh i started it i i, I heard it in, in some amateur choirs and when amateur choirs in Israel do it, and basically every amateur choir at some point does Rossi, it doesn't really sound very appealing sometimes because, uh, I mean, the setting of the choir and the, the very, very, very homophonic it's a bit too much uh, for me. So I was kind of traumatized. Yeah. And when Elam told me that we're going to do Rossi, I said, I'm not sure that that's my take, but I'm very happy he didn't listen to me. <laughs> well, the thing is that many, like the most, most of the people who performed Rossi performed it because they were Jewish and they felt that this is their music and they're making it. They didn't, they didn't come, come to this music from the, from the historical point of view, or, mm -hmm. or they didn't care so much how this music was performed and so on. And our ensemble was first and foremost an early music vocal ensemble. So we kind of specialized in music from that time. And because we were also Hebrew speakers, um, we, we had this, I mean, what now seems completely normal and logical, but back then was kind of special. Uh, that that we take this music, which normally people took it only because it was Jewish, uh, but we treat it as as historical music and perform it as we would perform historical music from that time. Yeah. Uh, and the reason we actually did it is because we were simply commissioned to join a recording. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm very happy it happened. It was 
was the first thing I did in Europe, basically. I just came here and then we did it. And it really opened the doors for us. And until today, we go all over the world and sing Rossi. Your recordings of Rossi that I've heard are, are truly a, a revelation. Uh, Doron, you know, I, I do Rossi with my chorus and, you know, we have 50 or 60 singers. We are a good amateur chorus. I think when one is going to do music from an earlier or from any period, you try to do the research. What did the composer have his in mind? What was the sound that the composer was thinking of? But then, of course, we have to relate it to the times we have and the performing forces uh, that we have. So uh, I remember uh, Robert Shaw was once asked, um, I was doing a workshop with him. There were, I think, 300 singers doing the Bach B minor mass. Yeah. And he was asked, uh, how, how can we do this? This is certainly not uh, historically accurate. He says, yes, but why should I deny all of you the pleasure of singing exactly. this piece? Yeah. Very good. Uh, yeah. There's something... And same goes for Rossi, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All my, my traumas from before, they <laughs> don't mean anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk then about I historical agree. performance uh, practice. Can you tell us about your research and, and how you go about determining the sound that you're looking for and what is the authentic way of interpreting these scores? Do, do, do I understand that you sing from the part books also? Yes. So first of all, uh, we don't use the word authentic because we don't know. It's it, it. It was used a little bit in the eighties and nineties, but it came out of fashion because it's clear that we don't know what is authentic and you know what. So we only do things that we find nice. So this is an important thing to say. Uh, then we try to do it in the same, as much as we know, in the same tools that they used. So um, we use only one singer per part. We are male singers, and uh, we use uh, the original part books, which makes you read and learn the music in a different way and perform it in a different way. Of course, by now we know it all by heart. Mm -hmm. um, just, just to clarify for our listeners, this music was not published in score originally, but each yeah, part no, there no was. Music at that time was was published in score. Right. The, the, the basses would sing in a part that had only their music, etc. And then compounding the confusion, shall we say, in Rossi's music that the Hebrew words are written from right to left. Uh, the music right. goes from left to right and the sequence of words from left to right. But you have to figure out which syllable goes with which note. Exactly. Yeah, but this is, uh, this is explained quite well in the preface for the publication of Rossi, where they say that basically the singers have to know the prayers. So. The reader will see that in the eyes of the composer, it seemed better to have the readers pronounce the letters backwards and read in reverse order the words of the song, with which they are all familiar, than to invert the musical direction from what is customary and have their eyes move with the notes from right to left as we Jews normally write, lest they go out of their minds. For in singing, the majority of those versed in the system of musical notation are also skilled in reading Hebrew, and it is right for the singers to make sure that the words are properly pronounced in their vowels, accents, and the details that enhance the beauty of the reading and they are praiseworthy. And in a way, I think that this is what made this project so closed and in fact made it also die out very quickly because you couldn't have just any singer, you know, to join in and kind of fill the gap, you know, the tenor was ill or something. You couldn't have like, um, like a non-Jewish person to come and, and and do it as opposed to the Jewish people who, who were working for the you know non non-Jewish people for sure in the court and they sang madrigals. Um 
they could technically also sing in the church services. I don't know if they did it th that, mm -hmm. but in terms of skills, it was possible. Yeah. But not the other way around. In the non-Jewish music from this period, one could substitute an instrument for a voice if a voice was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever performed the sacred music of Rossi with instruments, with the Theorbo accompaniment or? Uh, yeah, we sometimes um, experiment with that. Uh, we actually don't know much about it. Uh, it I mean, it's definitely something you, you can do theoretically, but we don't know if it was uh, uh, not frowned upon in the community, in the congregation of, yes. of Rossi at that time, uh, on doing that on Shabbatot and on Hagim. Yeah. I'm sure that during weddings and other stuff of that sort on weekdays, I yeah. think it was allowed. Yeah, but we, but of we course, cannot assume have, that on on about Shabbatot. If you have five men and and you need to replace one of them with a recorder, it, it just wouldn't sound good. That is right. so, mm -hmm. so Rossi is not heard from after sixteen twenty eight. Uh, Rabbi Modena moves to Venice and starts a music academy there, and there is even some witnesses that that say that they performed they were continuing to perform this kind of music even with instruments perhaps on simchat torah uh, but as you say after that the the practice seems to have more or less disappeared except for a few interesting uh, exceptions that are found in in venice in amsterdam and a few other places and the reason must have been because uh, in order to have singers who have the skills um, the necessary skills to sing it and some of it by the way is, is rather virtuosic especially the four part things very virtuosic like definitely for professionals in order to have that you have to have you have to have it embedded in society those educational structures that teach many people these things from which only you know some will stay and do it but you have to have it. Uh, otherwise, you simply don't don't have the people, and then you know the tenor is ill, and that's it, and, and you don't have the group anymore. And we know that there was also a plague um, in, in Mantova. So who knows? Maybe some people came a bit ill, and then they died out. Yeah. And also, the the, the musical style around was changing. That's also true. And uh, Rossi already in, in his madrigals has one style, but in the synagogue music is much more reserved and much more conservative and he's going a bit, he's reflecting a bit more to the Renaissance period and that might have gone out of fashion by then in other cities also, yeah. or in, in Mantova. So I think it was also regarded as old fashioned anyhow. Yeah. Although some of the pieces are more in the the new Baroque-ish style, more homophonic. But then you have pieces like, uh, I mean, you, you talk about the virtuoso singing, the Elohim HaShivenu, uh, with those long, long melismas. Uh, I remember showing it to one of my teachers in graduate school, and he said this reminded him of violin music, or the ornamentation in violin music. It was like, the, here was the ornamentation all written out and yes uh, one needs certainly a, a virtuosity to perform those those long lines those beautiful long lines it's also easier with one per part
Now you you went to Italy uh, with the film crew, with the Joseph Rocklitz, and you recorded this music on location uh, in the in the synagogue in Mantua and uh, other locations. Uh, I know when I took my choir to Italy 20 years ago, we were just dumbfounded by the acoustics and how the different that is from most of the venues that we have here uh, in the States. But tell us about that experience of, of performing the music there. It was great. Uh, it was not the Rossi synagogue, unfortunately, but right. the acoustic was one of the best ever. Yeah, yeah, for but, me. But yeah, I had as Doran said, it's 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 an 18th century synagogue, and it's the only one that survived. Uh, so we actually don't have any example of how things were in Rossi's time. But you also performed in the palace in the ducal. Yeah, palace. we performed in the palace, and this was, this was very also cool. very nice in the yeah. two palaces. Actually. Beyond the historical accuracy, there is the musicianship. I listen to your recordings and I hear the gorgeous phrasing and ensemble awareness as you take cues from one another. How do you achieve that? What is the rehearsal process like for you? And, and not just the rehearsal, but the score preparation that you do. We try to listen to each other and make musical phrases which goes with the textual phrases. We also know each other and that helps and we know what to expect and we know how each other breathes and how to read the body language already and to anticipate and that helps a lot and yes most most decisions come from the text and flow of the text we regard the music as an augmented text Taking the text and put and serving it on a on a plate of harmony. So we basically yeah. recite. Yeah. So we think a lot about reciting the text in, with notes in order to make the text even grander. Mm. And in the case of Rossi, at least the way they describe it in the preface, um, a better way to you know magnify the Lord and to raising i don't think we have like a secret uh, exercise that we do to make no. the blending better and to make that i think we've already done a lot of that stuff in other ensembles and each of us has their own experiences and own own secret exercises that we used to do and we apply it now as kind of more mature people and try to 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 do it professionally. Hmm. So uh, speaking of Rossi's uh, secular music, the, the madrigals, as you said, the, the language of those is, is certainly more advanced. One hears the kind of Monteverdi-ish secunda pratica, some crazy chromatic relationships and a lot of word painting. Um, you want to talk about your performance of those and, and how that might be different? Well, yeah, I mean, I thought we thought that it was a it was a great idea to first of all to combine it because, as I said in the beginning, mostly the Jewish music of Rossi was performed only for its Jewish qualities by people who were only interested in that. So we thought that it's very interesting to have this these madrigals and the songs. Uh, side by side because it could very well be that the same singers who sang the the songs of Solomon in the evening or in the morning depending on the day sang in the palace madrigals so it, it's the same set of skills the same set of expression same ornamentation same ranges just different subject matters mm -hmm. uh, and this is why also we called the our second album with Rossi's music, Il Mantovano Ebreo, because it really puts the two things side by side. One and just Mantovano, a person from Mantova, as the Christians could call anyone. And then Ebreo, it makes him also different. Uh, 
on one hand different uh, and on the other hand the music the language of music is similar in both i mean this was his novelty basically he used the same musical language also for the synagogue you, you don't find the the musical language in the madrigals a little bit more uh, shall we say modern a little bit yeah but but not not in a deep way not in a deep way okay Well, he allows himself a bit more to yeah, be polyphonic it's... or to go yeah uh, but I, I believe that it, it's because of the text if <laughs> if they were you know religious text that would be as juicy as the Italian Madrigals I wonder how cross it would be. yeah uh, you can see it for example in Al Nahavot Babel which is a very kind of colorful text and also there you see what colorful musical renditions and uh, So it's, it's just the context of it is different, but the musical language is more or less the same. Right? So. The, he was attracted to, in the secular works, certainly some of the mo- modern poets, the Mannerist uh, poets, and many of these are, are quite erotic. And I know that when you perform them, sometimes it's with a, with a wink or a raised eyebrow on certain, certain words that need to be brought out. Also, these, these madrigals, usually, if it's, it's done seconda paratica and with these kind of texts, it speaks for itself, and it's a bit easier for us to like interpret it. We don't have to f- reinvent the wheel and think, okay, so in this sacred thing, how will we make it more interesting? And in that one, uh, it already speaks for itself, and we just have to go and, and go through it. You have also done, um, of course, music by the other composers uh, of this period, and um, you have composed music that smacks of the sound of that period. Who's responsible for, for these pieces? Elam, can you talk yeah. about what you have composed and, and how you did that? Yeah, so basically I, I took this idea of Rossi of, of, of using the musical language of, of his time in order to do some, in order to set Jewish texts. And uh, I was very interested in the early operas. You know, the first uh, settings of the story of Orfeo and things like that. And it, I found it fascinating how one can tell a story in music. And I thought that In the spirit of Rossi, I might do a similar thing with uh, stories from the Bible. And the first thing I did was the story of Joseph and his brethren. Uh, again, I took a lot of inspiration from, from all the composers who composed in that era, especially the first opera, so Monteverdi, Cavalieri and Tuccini. Um, and also with the thought that It could very well be that Rossi did such things for some special Jewish events and that naturally none of this survived mm-hmm. because we have nothing surviving from Rossi apart from his printed things. So we can really go wild with our imaginations of you know what kind of things he they did for special Jewish occasions. Uh, they, they had so many talented, artists and he was active in a, in a Jewish theater group 
a yes and yeah as i said there were many artists and who knows what beautiful things they did mm. and for sure nothing survived so this helps a little bit with the fantasy yeah also enjoy that these are tailor-made for us i mean uh, how many singers today can can say that about early music pieces that, <laughs> that we have the privilege actually of having the the pieces composed for specific singers and for our rangers and for our abilities yeah. that we we are able to also give feedback and to change some some things if they are not exactly comfortable so, in this sense you could say that this yeah. is Uh, it's even more, more authentic a more authentic experience of of creation of music yeah, speaking of authenticity yeah. yes right uh, in general um musicians musicians nowadays uh, classical musicians or early music musicians are mainly busy with executing music but back then they were very much busy with creating music either by composing or by uh, improvising and So the thing to, to take part in the creation of music yourself is a very authentic uh, activity. Uh, and by th- doing that, we can also uh, give uh, early music lovers the experience of hearing something new <laughs> while still sounding like the music that they like. Wow, great perspective. Elam and Doron, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, and congratulations for the, the website and the initiative. And uh, thank you so much for having us. My pleasure. <laughs> mm-hmm.